Hey guys, what's up everybody? Welcome into the Guilty as Charged podcast. My name is Steven. I am your host. Joining me as always today are Alex and Tyler. Tyler, man, I love that name change for you today. How are you doing today, man? Uh, I'm doing just fine. I'm not going to explain it to anyone who does not know. For those <laughs> who are listening, my name on my YouTube handle, whatever, is I Need Interpreter No Good English. Uh, you can figure <laughs> out why. Uh, I'm doing very well. Um, if you can't tell, for those on YouTube, um, one of us has to stay up till or starting or the recording at 11 p.m. at night. And if, I wonder yeah. if you can tell by our names who that is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to put a whole lot of effort uh, into the name. <laughs> this is truly, truly an ungodly hour. Uh, first, Adam Silver has pushed back the finals for, oh, for so the last bad. like three years. And now oh, this, I mean, just, just terrible. Tyler, why can't you get out of class all the time or, or work? You know, I mean, come on. <laughs> all right just uh hey man i gotta get paid somehow <laughs> yeah exactly and, and you know it, like i understand doing the games later on when they're in phoenix but it's like i mean this is 8 p.m star for milwaukee fans too so i, I don't really understand that um hmm. but we got a fun show planned for you guys today we're gonna t we're going to talk about all of the espn top 10 lists which have come out recently uh the, for those on our audio platforms my name today is respect for Corey lindsley uh, which we'll get into in a second because that had me heated. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the uh, secondary and do our deep dive position breakdown for that group as well. Um, so let's start with the uh, Justin Herbert talk. Oh, I'm sorry. I almost forgot. We also have a great interview that Alex and I did with the director. Uh, for those of you that know him on YouTube, we were really excited to do that collaboration. Uh, as always, the audio version is going to happen right after I stop talking. The video version is going to be happening in a separate video. So without further ado, here is the director. All right, so let's get to the nitty gritty about Justin Herbert this week. Obviously in the news, there was the Patrick Mahomes thing. There was him being listed as a top 10 quarterback. So Alex, I'll let you kind of take the reins here with the Justin Herbert conversation really however you want, whether you want to talk about the Patrick Mahomes thing first or the ranking here, but why don't you kick us off first? Yeah, we can start with the Mahomes thing since I, I don't think that was as big of a deal as people want to make it out to be. Um, you know, apparently Mahomes said he was getting chirped at on the course by uh, Chargers <laughs> fans and Raiders fans and Broncos fans, which doesn't surprise me given that yeah. it's, it was uh, Lake Tahoe um, in terms of this golf tournament. So, you know, maybe he just felt the need to snap back. And it also sounded like he was just getting chirped at all the time because he he messed up the phrase in response to the guy, uh, which, yeah. which is what people do when they're annoyed. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's actual, you know, any drama there. People want to act like, he, you know, he's scared and stuff like that. Um, you know, also, like, to the Chargers fan that called him a bum, I mean... You know he's not a bum. I mean, we, we could have fun with it, but, you know, he's won his Super Bowl and his MVP. Now, yeah. you know, that being said, I, I will probably would probably call Tom Brady a bum in person. So, uh, you know, <laughs> everyone, has, everyone has their own different tastes and hatred. Um, okay, but going to the top ten list specifically, um, I was a little bit surprised that he was in the top ten. I kind of expected him to clock in just outside uh, that kind of range, but it, it didn't really surprise me either, just because you could argue the talent and the tools that he has as well. And, you know, the guys that you would really kind of argue um, that would be in front of him, you know, you could argue that, say, someone like Tannehill is a little bit older and that, you know, you have Herbert and Murray being the young guys with uh, the tools they have and both have one rookie of the year and are kind of on the upswing. So I didn't find much um, disagreeable there. <laughs> I know there might be some crazy Chargers fans like the director mentioned in our interview that would be like, he's got to be top five, but no, <laughs> he's pretty firmly, I think in the top 10. Um, personally, I would have probably nudged Kyler Murray ahead of him, but I don't think that's a big deal. And, you know, I guess the thing that's holding him in the top 10 is the omission of Deshaun Watson, but yeah. I think Justin Herbert, regardless, ha has earned his spot in this tier of quarterbacks. I love that Patrick Mahomes messed up. I hate that stupid quarterback. Everyone, I, I, He's fun to watch, <laughs> I guess, but otherwise his personality irritates me. On that Thursday night game when 
you know, the refs kept giving the Chiefs a bunch of first downs off of BS penalty calls, and he's like <laughs> pointing down the field. And from that moment, I just freaking hated the guy. Yeah, he's also very talented. But listen, Chiefs quarterbacks who beat up on the Chargers, I love Alex Smith, so it's not like I hate them. It just for some reason, Patrick Mahomes rubs me the, me the wrong way. Anyway, still funny that he messed up, but obviously it doesn't mean anything. It just you, know, yeah. you mess up your words. I mess up my words on the podcast every single time. Uh, as far as the list goes, you know, going Mahomes, Rogers, Brady, Wilson, Allen, Stafford, Dak, Lamar, Herbert, Murray. Obviously, no Watson. Like, if we're including Watson, I would put Murray in front of Herbert, and I would put Watson obviously in that list, which would bump out Herbert, and that's okay. And then, I mean, of course, it depends on how you look at it. Like, I took Herbert in our little fun mock thing. Who, which quarterback would you have and start your franchise with? I took Herbert first or, or second overall. Um, but I don't think this is quite how that list works. And so, right. you know, you're taking who they are right now, and I guess maybe some projection in there, I suppose. And um, like, I, I wouldn't put Herbert on this list, but that's not saying that he can't easily get into this list. Um, I could see him passing Lamar. I could, I could see him passing Murray. I could see him passing Stafford if he has an iffy year. You know, Josh Allen, maybe if he regresses, because especially because they're they're kind of considered very similar kind of players. So you know, it's no shame in him not being top ten just yet. I have no problem if he's there, um, and he was there at nine, and that's great. And it also obviously shows that you know, for all the criticism he gets from you know, fans and, and by fans, I mean, Dolphins fans or anybody who <laughs> didn't select Herbert, you know, that he's not a winner. Well, clearly, you know, yeah. I think I'm hoping because we're about to talk a list that was terrible, but, but I'm hoping that the executives and whoever that they pulled understands that, you know, Herbert is better than his record shows because, because he was, he really was. Yeah. You know, that's the thing like that we have to point out that I should have led with, you know, Jeremy Fowler, this is not his personal rankings, right? Like I saw some people were like, Jeremy Fowler's an idiot. It's like, this isn't him. Like, he's <laughs> he's pulling people within the league, you know, executives, coaches, and players, and things like that. And I think a couple of scouts you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I was pretty surprised that he made the list, that, at least the top 10, because, you know, traditionally, like all these coaches and, and executives, like, they like to see proven track records most. Like, I mean, Chase Young wasn't in the top 10 at the edge rusher spot, Justin Jefferson wasn't in the oh, top really? 10 at the receiver spot. So I, when I didn't see Chase Young, you know, I, I kind of th thought like, okay, like they're, they're probably not going to put Herbert in, you know, longevity thing and, and track record. So I was pretty surprised that he, he made it. And obviously not having Deshaun Watson like that, that definitely helps. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, the pecking order at the quarterback in the, in the National Football League right now is pretty clear. Like I think mm -hmm. you've got your tier one quarterbacks, um, depending on, on where Watson stands, like if he plays, right, you've got Mahomes, Rodgers, Brady, Wilson, and then Watson would be in that tier as well. And then I think you've got the second-tier quarterbacks, you know, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Um, you could put Matthew Stafford, maybe Ryan Tannehill in there as well. And then you've kind of got, like, the up-and-comers, right? Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield potentially, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert. And then you've got all the game managers after that. So – I was okay, you know. I would have been okay if he were, you know, like in the in the others category with like the caveat of like we think he's going to be in the top ten next year. I would have been fine with that, but him being at nine is fantastic, and I was very thrilled with that selection. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was also just going to say I was a little bit surprised uh, that they kind of just bumped Stafford up four spots, yeah. um, just because not because I don't think Stafford belongs there. But if we're just saying, oh, these are the top 10 quarterbacks, then, like, why was Stafford this low when he was on the Lions and this high when he was on the Rams? I understand the system argument there, but mm -hmm. I just feel like shouldn't it just be consistent regardless of which team is on? I don't know. But you, you can make an argument with the weapons and the coaching and also um, all that kind of stuff. But that was the only other thing that kind of surprised me in terms of the reception around the league. Uh, when it came to his stance kind of improving. So you said he bumped up four spots. Was there a previous ranking? Yes. Fowler's been doing okay. these lists, I, I think, for the last three yeah. years. Uh, something like that. It, it didn't say specifically in the article, but, you know, he, he has last year's series pinned to his profile, so you can, you know, kind of go look oh, and okay. compare. But um, I, I just realized I forgot to mention Dak Prescott in that uh, second tier as well. So, um, interesting, you know, conversation for, for Justin Herbert, but obviously very happy that he made it. 
The uh, most disrespectful thing that I've ever seen in any of these rankings is Corey Lindsley not making the top 10 and specifically being the fifth center listed in this article. And I understand, like, a lot of the media members have such a hard time judging offensive linemen. It's why you always see guys like Duke Manningweather and Brandon Thorne be so <laughs> upset about the all pro yeah. and global voting because people just like they have no idea. But it, it's never been easier to like properly judge offensive line play with all the advanced metrics that we have Absolutely. with PFF and ESPN. Um, and obviously, all these coaches and executives supposedly have access to the film. So uh, just going over things really quick, Corey Lindsley ranks first in every single category of those <laughs> metrics, run blocking grade, pressures allowed, pass blocking efficiency, um, and run blocking win rate on ESPN. And he ranks fifth in pass block win rate. So the numbers and the film, in my opinion, all show the best center in the league. Now, I could maybe make an un- I could maybe understand an argument for Frank Ragnow being listed over him at center. You know, Ragnar's a little more athletic, a little stronger in the run game, in my opinion, and he's younger, right? But Lindsley being the fifth center and not making the top 10 of the interior offensive line list is so, so terrible. Of all of these selections and all of these players who were left off or listed in the others category, Corey Lindsley not being in the top 10 is the worst one. And then the most annoying thing is like, there, there was nothing positive about him in his notes. It was like, he should help Justin Herbert. It's like, are we serious? This is so disrespectful. Like, come on now. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely disrespectful. Like, you already went down the list of metrics. But I don't understand because it's not like he's a low-profile guy. Right. Obviously, he played for Green Bay. So, you know, everyone knows who this guy is. They pass plenty of times. They run plenty of times. Um, you know, he led the, the number one pass blocking efficiency line in the NFL. He had zero penalties last year. Like, I just don't, I don't understand. I could see, like, okay, putting, like, Hudson ahead of him because Hudson has had a longer stretch of sustained success. Yeah. Fine. But, again, like you said, like, center five, potentially, and not even making the list. Just as, like, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I trust your film judgment. I have not watched a ton on him, but I trust your judgment there. And, like, like we said with, um, was it Ed Rushers? Yeah, and also Aaron Donald. Even if you don't watch the film – how can you look at any of the <laughs> metrics and say like uh fifth yeah like, being third, at least, like second or third maybe so uh, i guess playing devil's advocate you know he's not been again like he's not been consistently at this level he did miss some games last season and that's all i got like i really don't know how else <laughs> you would put him fit I, it, it blows my mind and so as much as i love the fact that herbert made you know the top 10 i don't know what happened here with the offensive line but like you said it is very difficult to judge offensive linemen, I guess. Hey, well, I was actually just about to ask, like, you know, oh, are they kind of trying to project maybe for, like, a bit of a future decline this season, all that kind of stuff? But Rodney Hudson is 32, and Corey Lindsley's 29, mm-hmm. about to be 30. So it's like, if that's your argument, then that's not really a thing in this list. So, yeah, I mean, just looking at all the metrics, being that last year was his first um, all-pro season, like, I just don't see how you could reject him. Uh, and every other season he's been in the league, like, he's played at that level despite, you know, not having that, you know, all-pro or pro. Uh, I think he's had a couple Pro Bowl nominations, or was last year his first? I think he's been a Pro Bowler twice. I think last year was his first all-pro. Yeah, Okay. Yeah, so maybe that's kind of it in in terms of just, like, looking at that because, you know, it's weird contrasting it with the wide receiver list, which we'll talk about later, because the wide receiver list was a bunch of guys that maybe fans wouldn't, like, naturally love um, in a way, Mm -hmm. but guys that still found a way to get that production, right, which coaches and executives all value a lot. Um, so, you know, in this case, are, are, is, are we just saying that there's really no stats to kind of really say, you know, hey, Corey Lindsley is this kind of player, despite there being all these analytics at this point, you know, how many pressures he allowed, how many sacks he allowed, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, right? So it feels like maybe that's the case, but even in that case, that also applies to all other centers and guards. So it's just, it is perplexing. 
Yeah, so I'm just pulling up the the Pro Football Focus stats right now. So Corey Lindsley had he allowed four total pressures. Frank Ragno allowed nine. So that one makes sense, I guess. Uh, Ryan Kelly, who was ahead of him in the others category, allowed twelve. Rodney Hudson allowed fourteen. Eric McCoy allowed fourteen. And McCoy and Hudson both missed a few games. And then mm-hmm. if we sort it to passing block pass blocking efficiency, um, Corey Lindsley was first, Frank Ragno fourth, Rodney Hudson fifth, Eric McCoy was tied for tenth, and then Ryan Kelly was tied for sixteenth. So I don't know. Like, obviously, everybody who listens to this podcast by now knows that I'm really passionate about offensive line play. (laughs) And, like, just the fact that, you know, one of the most elite players in the league at his position was disrespected like this, it just really got me fired up. That being said, you know, Justin Herbert being in the top 10 and and Keenan Allen, which we'll talk about now, being sixth, like, I guess from a Chargers fandom standpoint, like, like, that kind of balances itself out because I didn't think Keenan Allen would be that high, to be honest with you. You know, I know that he's got a lot of respect for his route running, but, you know, he still carries this, you know, weird tag that he, you know, doesn't, he's not able to stay healthy and he didn't have a thousand yards last year. So I wasn't expecting him to be at six. I was maybe expecting him to maybe squeak in or potentially even be in the others category. So, um, you know, that really shows, you know, the respect around the league that people have for Keenan Allen which obviously is, is a great thing for us to talk about. And it's a great thing for the chargers to have that kind of player. Yeah. I, I think that the big disconnect I think between the fans and what NFL personnel think is that, you know, we could talk about health and all that stuff, but I, I really think it just comes down to Keenan Allen is not the most exciting player to watch, right? He's yeah. a bit of a technician, you know, last year was the fewest yards per attempt. Uh, I think of his kind of recent career, Right. He's not a Justin Jefferson, so to say, where he's just going to burn you and then, you know, one move and he's gone. Right. Um, Aside from that, you know, great play that started that Patriots playoff game where he just deked Stefan Gilmore out of his cleats and then was in the end zone, which is fun. Um, But, you know, other than that, you know, he has never been that kind of a receiver. Um, And so I think that's been kind of the disconnect with fans. But, you know, he still gets to the production either way, right? He gets you to that 100 reception, 1,000 yards kind of year um, and is really one of the most technically sound of them with his route running ability. Uh, And I really couldn't complain about much stuff on the top 10 list as a whole. Uh, I think everyone was pretty deserving of being there. I have my hesitance with Mike Evans because I think he's kind of overrated. Um, I've never, <laughs> never been the biggest fan of Mike Evans, but I guess, you know, with the production, you can make the case that he's top 10. I personally would still choose Godwin over him on that team. Uh, so, but yeah, to, to me, there wasn't a whole lot to argue. It's just, Hey, these guys get the production and we're going to choose the 10 that we like the most. You can make cases for other people as, as we saw the Minnesota Vikings, uh, trying to make the case for Justin Jefferson being a top five receiver over Julio Jones and Devontae Adams and all those guys, which was crazy. Um, so I, I would not go that far, even for Keenan Allen. Um, yeah. but Keenan Allen clocking in at six, uh, I think, is the right call. Uh, I was a little bit surprised, but also, uh, yeah, I, I do think there's always been that disconnect because the players have always you know, complimented Keenan Allen's game too, including Devontae Adams. Yeah, and that's why I don't think when it gets brought up, you know, is Keenan Allen one of the most underrated receivers in the league? Like, I don't really don't think he is. Like, I think people generally that kind of know football appreciate him quite a bit. And anyone who uh, – fans that kind of aren't Chargers fans and maybe don't play fantasy football, I guess, like, they're like, eh, you know, he, he's all right. But, uh, okay, uh, Keenan Allen being sixth, I he's a guy that I would put in the top ten – but I don't think he could sniff the top five. Like for some reason, there's just this big jump to get in that top five that I just yeah. don't think he has done yet. Now, I'm not forgetting who his coaches were. I'm not forgetting about, you know, Rivers being Chuck Ball in 2019 and all the stuff that happened in the last few years and whatever. But he needs those games, those takeover games against either you know, the big time opponents or really good defenses. And last year he didn't really do that. You know, the year before, I think he had a couple of, of, of bigger games against some good defenses. 
she doesn't consistently have like that explosion. <laughs> Did Alex almost die? On the no, I just <laughs> dropped my phone because it's eleven thirty. <laughs> Man, my take was not good. He dropped it like it was hot. Um, uh, kill me. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I want to see bigger games out of him, and hopefully that like this is the season yeah. for that to happen. But he just doesn't like that. Him, everyone's like, oh, maybe he can be like a top five guy. Not everyone. Some Chargers fans really want to put him in the top five. I just can't put him there yet. I really want to. Yeah. He needs those bigger games. Well, I think the bigger games, and I think, you know, one of the biggest issues with when he was obviously playing with Philip Rivers is that Philip Rivers would like to spread the ball around. And one game, it might be a Keenan Allen game. You know, like I remember attending the Texans game in 2019 where Keenan had, you know, like 12 (laughs) catches and 15 targets. And then Mm -hmm. the next game, it was like, it was Austin Eckler's turn. Austin Eckler had, you know, 19 targets and, and 15 catches or whatever. So that, that, I, that I have always felt like kind of hurt his reputation and yeah. the touchdown thing, right? Like, you know, he's he's not a big touchdown guy. And so, you know, I think everybody respects his route running ability at this point. Uh, Brian Baldinger had him listed in his top three in, in terms of route running, which was fun to see today. But I just think people look at him as kind of a player with a limited ceiling because he, like Tyler was saying, he doesn't have the explosive plays and he doesn't have the touchdowns. Like you look at everybody else on this list in the top 10, we pull it up to make sure I'm not – missing anybody um, really quickly. But, you know, I think you have like the top five from this, from this, uh, this current season, right? You've got, sorry, I'm, I'm stalling while I pulled up. All right, here we go. Okay. Devonte Adams, number one, Deandre Hopkins, two, Stefan Diggs, three, Tyree kill four, five, Julio Jones. Like we've seen all of those players have, you know, 200 yards and two touchdowns on a consistent basis. And, you know, they're scoring 10 plus touchdowns pretty much every season. And then you've got Keenan. I feel like that's kind of like where the tier break starts, like with Keenan, Mike Evans, Michael Thomas, DK Metcalf, uh, AJ Brown is in the 10, and you've got Kevin Reedley and some Jefferson after that. So, you know, we could potentially be looking at, you know, Keenan Allen dropping out of the top 10 next year with all those young guys if they have these big seasons. So not that it matters to Keenan Allen, but, you know, he, he's got to be able to kind of, make that leap like Tyler was saying if he wants to stick in the in the top six to eight range. I would say the the thing with Keenan Allen's game is that he's kind of formatted it to the point where I feel like he has a pretty high floor. Um I yeah. don't know if he'll ever climb into the top five. Also because of his age and also because of his play style. Like the fact that he does have a four seven forty, like I, I don't yeah. know if he's ever going to have quite that dynamic enough like athleticism to really be that but I also don't think that you know if if he is a guy that's going to have you know 100 receptions a thousand plus yards which you know he's been doing like clockwork the last few years I just don't think that that's going to ever really be lower than like top 15 in the league um right but yeah so I, I think that that's just kind of the case and you know if we're going to talk about consistency and like doing that, you you know, I, I looked at Mike Evans' Pro Football Reference, and I have to rant about this. But he had <laughs> I had two. It. I was waiting for it. He, he had two games in the first six where he had two yards, and he had two games where he had a hundred yards. I was just like, yeah. I, well, there was that one of those games that he had two yards. He had two touchdowns though. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. And people have always said, like, oh, well, you know, it was a Jameis issue, and he gets a better quarterback, and it's the same thing. You know, (laughs) he's just super hit or miss, in my opinion. I don't know. I've never been a fan of his route running. Uh, I really just think that he's, you know, I don't know, modern-day Vincent Jackson. Like, I I don't think he's ever been much better than that, personally. But, um, yeah, so... (laughs) That's my rant about Mike Evans. I'm not, I promise I will not slander him again. <laughs> well, like to your point, I, I feel like he's just like a more heavily targeted Mike Williams. Like, you know, he's yeah. just a jump ball guy, big physical player. And against certain teams like that works. But for whatever reason, whenever he plays other physical corners, then he gets shut down. Like Marshawn Lattimore, you know, has carried this like top 10 reputation simply for the fact that he shuts down Mike Evans. And it's like, yeah. well, there's 14 other games that they play, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and, like, that's the thing from uh, Mike Williams is just, like, if you 
you know, increase your route running or make your route running better just a little bit then you can be a top 15 or top 10 receiver, which is kind of like the crazy, crazy thing about it. Um, so, yeah, that that's just my thought is that I don't think, I guess the gap between like the top 30 guys in the league and the top 15, top 10, it really isn't that much in terms of skill set. Yeah. So the last one is obviously the running back list. Um, Austin Eckler was not listed in any capacity. Uh, frankly, I'm not super surprised because of the missed games last year. I think if he had had a full season, he probably would have made the list. But, um, you know, a lot of people were, were pretty upset that Austin Eckler didn't even make the others category list. But uh, like I said, I, I just think that's an injury thing. I think that, you know, if he had played even, you know, 12, 14 games, then he would have made the list. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think like. Would Darren Sproles? I, mean, I think Eckler has better you know, numbers than Darren Sproles. But like, would the Darren Sproles have made like a top ten list or, or with the others list? Like, I don't really think so. And so, yeah, Eckler not being there is completely fine with me. Right, and I think that's also about like, do people think of Austin Eckler as a running back? Right, like I don't no. know, like if we get into that question, but we talked about him lining up, lining up in the slot and lining up <laughs> all of us. <laughs> <laughs> lining up in the slot and lining up all over the field. Um, and so I, I think that that's interesting. Just, you know, I don't know if he's considered the same way that like Alvin Kamara and Dalvin Cook and Derrick Henry, like, does he really play the same position uh, yeah. as those kind of guys? But yeah, so uh, I, I don't think either way that he deserved to make a top 10 list. I, I don't know how you could include Austin Eckler in that, especially given the games missed last year. But you know, if he does wind up playing all 17 games this year, uh, then I think that he has a chance to make it, at least if he accumulates enough uh, receiving yards like he did in 2019. Alec, I'm really surprised that you just glossed over an Urban Meyer joke like that. <laughs> I didn't hear the joke, actually. Um, so what was okay. the joke? Uh, you said most people don't view or something view Austin Eckler as a running back. And I said, Urban Meyer wouldn't because of Travis Etienne. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't hear the joke at all. My Explaining audio, the like, joke makes it funnier. Yeah. <laughs> Way funnier. All right. So we'll, we'll wrap up this conversation with this question, which I think is super interesting. If you had to pick a player on the Chargers roster that did not make one of these lists to make the list next year, who would you pick and why? Mm. So we're uh, talking boy. wide receiver, running back, or oh, so in general. general. So any list, it can be any list, any of the defensive positions, any of the offensive positions, <laughs> just okay. someone that did not make the list. So you, Mr. Adderley, Michael Davis, Kenneth Murray, Jerry Tillery, Mike Williams, Eckler, yeah. um, Rashawn Slater, like any one of, of those players. I'll say Davis. Um, just because I, because of his skill set and the way that he can improve, I think that that's kind of the most dangerous one out of those guys. Um, I think you could make an argument for Slater, uh, cracking that as maybe like the, you know, Justin Herbert of next year, where it's just like, hey, this guy burst onto the scene. Um, but yeah, I think I would go with Michael Davis just because. I think Brighton Staley's scheme will suit him well, and I think he showed that he can go against top receivers uh, at a pretty high level last year, including Stephon Diggs. I'm going to go with Jerry Tillery, and I don't know why wow. that's the one that I thought of. Okay, here's why. Uh, I can't name more than five other defensive tackles that would have made this list. Like, if you asked me to make a list of <laughs> ten defensive tackles, I would have just started naming, like, Cortez Brown. I don't know any <laughs> tackles. So to me, like a former first round pick in this defense is supposed to be really good, a high profile defense. He could take that next step. Like I think Steven's really hot on him taking that next step. Sure, why not? Because honestly, I like if I were making this list, I couldn't name enough defensive tackles. So if he has a great breakout season, yeah, I'd probably throw him on my list. Well, and I think that's an interesting one because defensive tackles got a lot of older guys that have being consistently making the list like Fletcher Cox has been a staple on that list for like 12 years. It feels like, um, so, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. I'm really intrigued by the Michael Davis selection. I, I, I was going to take the obvious one in Kenneth Murray, but I, I could definitely see a world in which Michael Davis makes that leap because, 
you know, we've we've all heard, you know, the the tools aspect, and you know, we're going to talk about the secondary. So maybe this is kind of our segue here. But I, I'm so curious to see how high Michael Davis can climb because mm-hmm. he made such a big, you know, such big strides last season, and now he's getting a scheme that fits him better. He's getting, you know, maybe not specifically better positional coaching. You know, I think, you know, uh, yeah. Ron Miles was a fantastic position coach, but, you mm-hmm. know, certainly going to get a better defensive coordinator and a better scheme that could play to his skill set. So I I think Alex, you know, got the ball rolling here, and I think I would choose Michael Davis for that spot as well. I'll Which see. is crazy to talk about out loud, like considering we were, you know, talking about Brandon Faison starting over him last summer. Which, oh man, good times. But we we did really well last summer between the Herbert <laughs> stuff and Faison starting over Davis. We did a really good job projecting. Thanks everyone for subscribing. I'm sure we'll do an even better job, and by that I mean worse this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about this secondary. I, I'm gonna try not to talk about injuries and death as much as for this position, um, which I, I think the Michael Davis, you know, can he take another breakout step it, is a very interesting topic. I know Nasir Adderley is a very popular breakout selection for this team as well. Um, so I guess, you know, who really is going to step up and be, you know, a high level playmaker alongside Derwin James, if he's able to stay healthy. So who's going to be that guy? Is it going to be Chris Harris? Is Chris Harris going to come back and have a career Renaissance season or, or is Michael Davis going to take that next step? Um, so I guess that's my biggest question mark is, is who's really going to establish themselves as a high level, potentially elite kind of playmaker for this defense. Yeah, I would probably say that I don't know if Chris Harris is going to have a renaissance, um, but I do think he can be, you know, what he was, you know, in the later years in Denver, particularly as a slot corner, not he was on the outside. Um, But I think he can get back to that for sure. Um, And if you made me pick kind of one of the young guys between Adderley and Samuel and all those guys that are going to be a playmaker and and step up and probably go with Samuel. Um, I I do kind of still need to see it from Adderley. And I think I really like that, you know, we talk about Harris and Samuel working uh, at safety a little bit and working all over the field. I just think that would play really well uh, in Brandon Staley's defense. And it doesn't seem from what we saw with the Rams last year that it's actually too much for, uh, for rookies to handle. Like Darius Williams had an awesome season. uh, And so I, I think that, you know, Asante Samuel can kind of pick up, you know, where he left off last year, but in a more complicated kind of versatile scheme. So um, those would kind of be my two guys. But yeah, my my question is just movement uh, and rotations when it comes to this team, just kind of seeing who, who plays where. And I also expect it to be a lot less rigid than the Bradley scheme, which was just, right. you know, I mean, quite frankly, you know, CB1 covers wide receiver one and CB2 covers wide receiver two and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, that's, that's sort of what it was. And that's what a lot of NFL teams do. But I think when you bring in somebody like Brandon Staley, who's going to be kind of changing that, um, that'll be interesting. And that, and that plays into the potential of why I think somebody like Davis could have a breakout year, but it may also be harder and more complicated. So, um, yeah, I, I would just say the movement and and where guys start because I don't think you'll just see the normal, you know, Davis CB one, Samuel CB two, and you know, Harris slot corner that like Chargers fans and you know NFL fans have kind of gotten used to. I, I do think it'll be more complicated than that, and you'll see them, you know, move around to safety, move back to corner, you know, move all over the field, uh, and so plus you have Derwin and Nasir likely in those two high uh, safety sets, uh, you know, a, with the potential of a web or a Gilman coming in at times. So, yeah, I think it's just kind of the rotations and movement at this point. Yeah, I know you hit it definitely right there. This is such an interesting part, and I think probably the most interesting group uh, of, of the offense or defense, in my opinion, because of Brandon Staley. And Arjun just did a great yeah. video on, the, on what makes – you know, the corner group, the most important part of the defense. And, or maybe it was a secondary. No, I can't remember. Uh, but it's such an interesting rotation that's 
potentially going to happen when Harris mentioned, you know, that him and Samuel Jr. They're going to play more safety. Like what is, what is that going to look like? Is that out of necessity? Yeah. Is that out of preparation? Because you know that Thurman James is probably going down or is that something that you're going to work on throughout the, the you know, depending on your matchups, depending on who's in front of you, uh, who knows? Um, I would like to know one of the reasons that I didn't want Staley and the chargers to draft a corner in the first round is because a, they needed a tackle obviously, but B, you know, Staley with the guys he had last year with the Rams, granted he didn't draft any of them, not that he drafted anyone anyway, but it wasn't like, you know, they were there before he got there. And so for him to take a bunch of guys in the fifth, sixth, a bunch of undrafted free agent guys and turn them into the number one defense in the NFL, granted they yeah. had Ramsey and Donald, you know, can he do that again with the chargers and how fast can he do it? Because it's not like they went out and did a bunch in the secondary to acquire guys. They just, you know, kind of had a couple of pieces, but mostly kept the group intact and lost Casey Hayward, lost Rayshon Jenkins. And he seems, Staley seemed very confident that he can maximize this secondary based on what they have. Now, is it overconfidence? Are they just, you know, saying great things about them, but they're going to really retool it in 2022? I don't know. Either way, I'll be patient, but I, I was still, I'm, I can't wait to see what Staley's going to do with them because he really seems to get the most out of guys who aren't considered, you know, high end talent. And, you know, Miles kind of did that as a, as a, um, as a position coach for a long time, but now the coordinator gets to oversee all of it. And, you know, we'll see. I, I think I'm hoping it happens quickly. You know, I'm hoping they can get after Ryan Fitzpatrick pretty early, but I'll be yeah. patient too. Well, and Ryan Fitzpatrick is, you know, either going to have an awesome, awesome, like 400 four touchdown game against the Chargers, <laughs> or he's going to throw for 200 and three or four interceptions. So it yeah. could be a really great start for the secondary right off the bat for sure. Um, I- I'm curious to see who's going to win that third safety spot because, you know, I am not like 100% confident that this person will play a ton. But I, I think based off of what, you know, I've kind of studied and, and watched specifically last year is that whoever is the third safety is going to be on the field quite a lot, like 30 snaps a game kind of player. And, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, them not addressing the safety position earlier was, you know, a show of confidence for Nasir Adderley and Derwin James. And, but it was also a show of confidence in potentially in Alohi Gilman and Mark Webb. And being able to develop those kind of players into, you know, starting level players. And, you know, Mark Webb, I think it, I'm very intrigued by, like, his physical frame is is kind of like a safety linebacker hybrid type of player. So, you know, I can definitely see him playing some star and money for this team. But, you know, who's going to be that third safety? And when that third safety comes on the field, like, is that person in the box or is Derwin James in the box or, you know, what kind of like Alex was saying, like what's the rotation at safety. So that's definitely something I'm really excited to, you know, get my eyes on and, and see, you know, who is going to step up between Mark Webb and Alohi Gilman. I would also say that I, th- I thought it might've been more of a show of confidence in Mark Webb than it was in Alohi Gilman. Um, just because it seems like the chargers were like, hey, you know, we can wait until the sixth or seventh round because we yeah. know this guy is going to be there, right? Um, so if they feel that confident in him to the point where they didn't draft a guy in the fifth or sixth round, you know, or the fourth round like a lot of people wanted, then I do think there is kind of maybe a bit of a hot seat when it comes to Alohi Gilman. I think either way, whether he's the third safety, uh, I mean, he's going to have to play defense, obviously, but, you know, he may be kind of limited to just that special teams role if they really do like Mark Webb. Um, yeah. So that's that's the kind of thing that I thought was, you know, plus also drafted by the old regime. So, uh, you know, I don't really know what the new staff thinks of Gilman, but I do know what they think of Webb based on, you know, Brandon Staley kind of waxing poetic about him. Uh, so that was kind of the thing I thought is, is Gilman a little bit on the hot seat? I don't know. I guess. I think that Mark Webb thing is kind of homerism, man. Like they, like they had confidence in him. Like they were like, there's the last pick. You know, they didn't do anything in free <laughs> yeah, agency no. and they waited the entire draft and like, aha, Mark <laughs> Webb is there. Like, okay. So let's say that they, <laughs> they were conf- if they were confident, okay. If you knew that the, this group had issues and they had injury issues as early as last season, and they waited a long time because they knew this guy was going to be there on late day three. Why can't we say the same thing about Larry Roundtree then, Alex? 
Oh, no, I mean, yeah, I think that's a fair point. The only thing I would say is that somebody like Mark Webb and Lee Gilman would, are more likely to have to play significant roles on defense, right? Like, I mean, Larry Roundtree is likely either going to play special teams or, you know, he'll get, like, a couple carries, you know? Like, I, I don't think he'll get more than that because you already have Justin Jackson and Joshua Kelly ahead of him on the depth chart. Um uh, you know, I'm not saying that they wait. <laughs> they just specifically waited. You know, all three days of the draft. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. oh man, it's the second round. Well, we gotta <laughs> wait for that Mark Webb guy. Um, <laughs> I don't think it, it worked like that. But um, I, I do think that there was some confidence that they had. It's like, okay, you know, if we have these two or three guys that we like in round six, round seven, somewhere around there. Um, keep in mind, Alohi Gilman was drafted, you know, in the sixth round too, right? It's not yeah. like he was necessarily a day two pick that Mark Webb will be competing with. Um, so plus, I mean, Alohi Gilman was barely on draft boards, you know, much less, you know, coming out of college. So, um, I, I'm not sure what the new staff thinks of him. I, I'm not saying it really puts a lot pressure on Alohi Gilman, but I do think considering he didn't really play a lot of snaps last year and it was more of a special teams role and plus they're bringing this guy in that they drafted you know that's kind of mm -hmm. the thing that i see so i guess you know kind of diving in a little bit deeper there is i can't imagine they they would cut alohi gilman right no 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 i i, I don't think so the, um but you know it, it, you i mean you just asked who's going to be safety three and yeah, I, yeah. I don't know if it's an a absolute certainty that it's going to be uh, Gilman in that case. I think it could be a good chance that it's Webb. Yeah. yeah you're just saying hot seat for the job, not necessarily the roster. Yeah, yeah. And, and no. I, yeah. I think, well, he has to make the roster because the secondary is, is pretty thin. I know Steven yeah. just said, well, we won't talk about depth <laughs> and, you know, for, the, for the 48th time. But, you know, it is pretty thin. So I, he has to make the team. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think there's a way that they won't carry four safeties. Also, just because Tom Palesco doesn't tend to like throw out draft picks after one year. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I guess my last question is, is there going to be a surprise roster make from this group? Because I know Tyler is, is pretty, <laughs> high, pretty high on uh, a certain safety from Charlotte. But you know, I I I I haven't watched him. I, I probably should, but you know, is maybe you know, like this talk about Asante Samuel Jr. and Chris Harris playing a little more safety, maybe that lends, you know, a, a larger hand towards like a John Brannon or a Dante Vaughn making the mm -hmm. roster as well, and then you know, kind of loading up on corners instead of safeties. So I mean, Tyler, you can make your case for Ben DeLuca making the roster here and now. Um, that's just kind of my last question is like, who is the surprise roster or who is the player that could surprise and make this roster? Maybe it's Ben DeLuca. Maybe it's someone else. Yeah. My Ben DeLuca case was mostly just because it's not, I don't think it's going to be on Bamiga because the, like, why would you need another linebacker who really doesn't seem like he can cover? Whereas, yeah. you know, yeah. Okay. So if you can have, corners that can play some safety that's great maybe you don't need us a safety but also deluca is a safety who can also play some corner not really outside corner but he does have that versatility so he can play the slot for sure yeah definitely so i think that kind of in, in the same vein works out for him uh, but they just don't have bodies they have nobody else like if you're right. talking about surprise guys to make the roster like yeah it could be deluca it could also just be freaking you know uh jalen Watkins when they decide to sign him yeah because i, I can't like they're really going to go into the preseason I, listen, I, like I said, I have all the faith in the world in Staley to develop these guys, but I just how can you, how can you actually feel confident in the group that you have behind Drew and James? Even if you kind of like Nasir Adderley, like, like how confident can you really be? Yeah, like I'm still surprised. You know, obviously they're not going to sign Richard Sherman, but I'm, I'm still <laughs> very surprised that they have not signed another safety yet. So yes. I don't know. I have a question, and we can go back to your question too, sort of, but. Okay, Derwin James goes down. Who are you playing at strong safety? Is it Gilman? Is it Webb? Or are you doing something crazy with like Kaiser White? I think we fast forward to next season. <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, I would play. I would play Webb. I would play Webb at strong safety. I think he's got 
the body and the makeup to do better than Alohi Gilman. I think Alohi Gilman, um, I don't know, man. It's tough for me to be like optimistic about Alohi Gilman because I didn't, yeah, after they drafted him, I just, I, I didn't really like what I saw on film. Um, you know, just saw kind of a player that, that really played out of control, that really wasn't, you know, good in technique and wasn't a great athlete. Um, you know, but he, he plays hard and he has a really high motor. And so I, I certainly understand taking a shot on him. Um, but I, I would play Mark Webb there if it were me. Um, or I would go sign Jaleel Adai, Ducks for cover. Uh, <laughs> I'm down. But, well, I mean, at that point, they would have to sign like a Jaleel Adai or, yeah. you know, a Rayshon Jenkins, who, whoever it might be. Like, you would just need a body at that point. Like, Well, Rayshon's in Jacksonville. Oh, I meant... Uh, Jalen Watkins. J- Jalen Watkins. I get Jalen Rajon. I, I get those two confused all the time. Um, but yeah, no, I think you would have to sign one of those two at that yeah. point. It definitely is really surprising. Like you watch the Rams play even like the first game, and you see four or five safeties on the field, right? Like you have Jordan Fuller, you have Caleb Rapp, and you have Terrell Burgess, and you have John Johnson. All four are on the field at the same time. And so like Naturally, like all of us were just like, oh, like they're going to, you know, take a safety higher, maybe add a safety and free agency, like load up on safeties. And they have a lot of corners. And so, you know, maybe that answer is putting Chris Harris back at safety or doing some other things. But, you know, like it, it is really surprising that your fifth safety has been an undrafted safety in from from Charlotte and your fourth safety is either a seventh round pick from Georgia or a sixth round pick from Notre Dame. Like. It, it's definitely a head scratcher still to this day, even though he's Brandon Staley and company have really expe- expressed some confidence in this group. But yeah, it's just, it, it's a little weird for me. It's, but even like the bears and studying them who always had two linebackers on the field, like they always had three safeties or three corners on the field. And so it, it, it still <laughs> is weird to me that, you know, we have no idea who's the third safety going to be. And we have no idea what to expect from the second safety. And, and yeah. It's just weird. The only name that I'll throw out there with, we were talking about Dante Vaughn and, and sort of those guys, Kevin Hall uh, kind of wouldn't shock me if he made the roster um, just because yeah. this coaching staff did pick him up on waivers. Um, and, you know, I was actually reading uh, from Michael Peterson. He actually does have a bunch of pass breakups that he had in college. And we know that kind of ball hawkishness or like kind of getting at the ball is sort of a trait. Uh, in Brandon Staley defenses. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't predict him to make the roster over Tavon Campbell, but it wouldn't shock me if he really made the back end of it. Maybe it was like that CB6, or, you know, he was one of the first guys off the off the practice squad, right? Um, so that's kind of a name that wouldn't surprise me, just kind of looking at Dante Vaughn and all the other guys there. But we'll also get a much better idea of that in the preseason. Oh, yeah, Definitely. It feels like, okay, so every year with the Chargers, it's always been the offensive line. Okay, they need offensive line help. Why did you neglect the offensive line? Well, we feel good about our offensive line. Of course, the fans know that's bullshit. And then the offensive line does terribly. What is going like? I can't figure out. Like, I'm trying to put a legitimate reason, unless they like are really, really think that they can make the most out of this, this group. And I guess they have to. Like, why would you not... It's, but when you need your secondary to make this defense work, why did they not invest more? I, I are, are are we not like are we assuming that the secondary is going to have a bigger role than we think they do? Like that's that's really stupid. But like okay, our linebackers going to have a bigger role is what I'm trying to say. Like are we kind of just thinking that it's always going to be like what Staley did with the Rams? You know, Robert Gates talked about they have to adapt and they, he asked Staley has to adapt with the team that he has. Yeah, did they not really go? Like they drafted a, a linebacker before they drafted a safety. Is there a chance that they are actually like we're thinking of this like incorrectly, if you will? Like we we think it's going to be so secondary driven, and I suppose in some respect with Derwin James and this year Adelaide and Harrison Davis, it will be. But like, do they, are they not worrying as much because of they, they feel like the linebackers are going to play a bigger role, or are we are they just overlooking this this position group? I think it's kind of both, honestly. Like, I, I think, you know, we, we watched so much of the Rams defense last year and, 
you know, it, it was a personnel thing. Like they didn't have the kind of linebackers that, you mm-hmm. know, um, that they had in Chicago when he was there, or maybe even in Denver with Josie Jewell and, and those guys. But it, it, I think it, we are maybe overthinking a little bit and maybe, you know, Drew Tranquil and, and Kenneth Murray are like never going to come off the field. But I, I still think you would need more than four safeties just for, right. for depth purposes, especially when you have a guy like Derwin James who hasn't been able to stay healthy. He's your Adderley hasn't really proven much. So sure. Like, yeah, it's totally possible that we're overthinking things and that the safeties are not as important as we think they are. But like, I, uh, even if that's the case, even if you're only going to have two on the field at the same time, like it, it just, it doesn't make sense to me why you wouldn't kind of, you know, take a, a you know, a, a better shot at, you know, landing a potential yeah. depth piece, potential starter kind of safety, even if you are confident in, you know, overcompensating for your lack of depth. I, I was just kind of wondering, I feel like that, they don't feel like they can play around a Derwin James injury if it happens, right? Like, if if it does come to that scenario, maybe you're just kind of boned either way. Like, yeah, Trevor Merrick would be nice if they drafted him in the second round, but then that means that you don't have Asante Samuel, and then that means, okay, well, now Derwin James is hurt, so we're throwing Trevor Merrick out there because like, they're main safety. Um, yeah. I don't know. I hey, know. I think that Derwin James is just such a huge player. We talked about this when Daniel Popper made the list, but like, yeah, I mean, he's the second most important player and there's no one that you can really replace him with. So I do think safety depth is concerning. um, And you can definitely, if they wanted to re-sign Jaleel Adai or Jalen Watkins or, uh, you know, any of the guys that we talk about tomorrow, like, yeah, they, they could do that or sign somebody else just for depth. But really every move that you're making in response to an injury is reactive and Derwin being that key cog in there, there's not really a reactive move you can make just because of how important he is. Right. (laughs) You know, it would be like last year if we would try to, you know, replace Joey Bosa with Jerry Tillery on the end, for example, Um, you know, that, that would be hard. Um, That would be, yeah, (laughs) that would be really difficult. Um, So, yeah. Uh, that's just what I think it is. There, there's no real way to replace Derwin. So I feel like their right. attitude is, well, Derwin's going to stay healthy and we're going to have two safeties on at the same time. So that's just kind of going to have to be what it is. Um, if Derwin gets hurt, then you adjust to it and try to adjust to it then. But I don't think there's much you can do beforehand, I guess. Not that I'm excusing them for not drafting safety earlier. I'm just saying that's that may be how they think about it. Yeah, and I, I guess, you know, everything that we've kind of heard, obviously, sitting here in July, it's very, very early. But everything we've heard about this upcoming draft is that it's pretty strong in the secondary uh, and it's pretty strong in the edge rusher in terms of defense. So, you know, maybe that was kind of their thinking and waiting on the safety is, hey, we don't really love this safety class. So we're going to wait until next year to grab someone that we love. I guess, you know, if you're you're playing the long game, like, sure, that, that could make some sense. But. Yeah, so, all right, guys, any other thoughts on the secondary before we wrap up today's show? Um, I mean, I would just, in short, and Alex already touched on that, I would like to see Chris Harris get back to form because I, I really think he's yeah. got the guys around him to, to finally do that. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm excited to see how it all plays out. And, and really, uh, I'm, I'm when we watch the preseason, just the guys that are the depth. Um, Cause you know, we, we can look at it now and be like, Oh, it'll be these four safeties and these six corners. Uh, and then, you know, Brandon Staley will <laughs> flip it on its head and be like, Hey, you know what? Dante Vaughn made the team. Uh, <laughs> he, and he's your fifth quarter. You know, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be shocked if something like that happens just because again, it is a new coaching staff and the way that preseason plays out, can be completely different. Um, so, you know, if somebody's good on special teams or a coach just notices one specific trait, that could be the difference between them, you know, making the practice squad and making the active roster, right? So um, that's kind of the thing. And, and I think it's really hard to predict cornerback traits and safety traits of guys that we've watched, but we haven't watched to the extent 
that we have Chris Harris and Derwin James and all these guys. Um, so, so that's going to be kind of fun to watch in the preseason coming up in, in exactly one month. Uh, the preseason is now exactly one month away. So excited for that. Yeah, we're excited for that. Excited for training camp in a couple of weeks. And we all know that Tom Telesco would love for Dante Vaughn to make this roster. I think he would be so, so happy with another Notre Dame uh, <laughs> Golden Domer on the roster since uh, Isaac Rochelle left. Um, but, yeah, that's going to do it for us today, guys. Make sure and check out Arjun's latest video. I just did a breakdown on Drew Tranquil as well. Um, and make sure and hit that subscribe button. The like button is always welcome. And, of course, the comments, ratings, and reviews on the audio platforms as well. So that's going to do it for us, and we'll see you guys next time. I'm going to bed. <laughs>